So why don't you, why don't each person on the panel introduce yourself, um, who you are, what you're doing. Uh, Francesco, founder of Airline Solutions. I've been dabbling with Airline for a long time now. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'm Jose Valin, creator of Elixir, co-founder of Platform Attack. Uh, Robert Bulling, one of the original creators of Airline. I now work for Airline Solutions. I'm Eric Meros Johnson. Uh, I'm on the core team, and I created Ecto and Hix. I'm uh, Dave Thomas. I'm a programmer. <laughs> I'm uh, Chris McCord. I created Enix, and I'm a, the lead developer at Little Lines. Um, I think we'll start this off by asking um, what you see is the biggest barrier to adoption for um, Erlang or Elixir, your choice, whichever one you work with the most. Starting with you, Francesco. Mm, good question. Hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start with Jose? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's use. Yeah, yeah. so. This isn't a clear conference, so let's start with Jose, I think. Sure. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think we, we actually talked about uh, those things throughout the conference, which is exactly thinking functionally and thinking con concurrently. So, for example, today, the, the Elixir material, uh, in particular on the website, is mostly a language reference, the intro to our mat uh, material, and then we go to advanced guide. There isn't really an introductory guide about uh, thinking functionally. Uh, the only material I can recall is Introducing Elixir by Simon St. Laurent, and he also wrote Introducing Elixir. He actually wrote Introducing Elixir, and then we got Introducing Elixir, which is really starts at the foundation, how you need to think about pattern matching, and, and everything and so on, and it builds uh, at some point to concurrency. And I think this is how we, as you said in your talk, right, it's so that we can push. I think just to add to, to what Jose was saying, uh, we, you know, we were translating our airline training material to Elixir, and Jose was giving us feedback, and his first reaction was, oh, interesting, you're focusing on the concurrency aspect of the language which is, you know, in our words, what you know, the whole Erlang virtual machine and the Beam emulator are all about. Yeah, yeah I'll, be d I'll say um, it's not running on the JVM. Uh, <laughs> Pardon? Best thing and worst thing. Best thing and worst thing, uh, yes. I, I think that's seriously a problem. I think a lot of, pl a lot of places um, run, they're, they're, they're using the JVM in the system, and that's what they want to continue using it, seeing it's not running on it. It's really not interesting. Um, there are alternatives. There is our Jang, which is our lang f on the JVM, which I'm guessing would probably run Elixir straight off. It does. Uh, it does. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, it does. It does do that. So, yeah, there are alternatives, but I think I see, see that as a real problem. And Eric? Right, um, a great package manager, of course. <laughs> um, no, but I really think that um, it's something that can help the ecosystem grow and flourish. Uh, can help, of course. I think that's really important right now, now that uh, 8.0 is coming, that we get a good ecosystem and um, that people start creating things, basically. So I see one of the big problems that the sweet spot for Elixir and Erlang are applications which are non-trivial. Um, and non-trivial doesn't have to mean massive, but it means complicated, highly connected, or whatever else. And the problem with that is it doesn't really lend itself to 12-line examples on a blog post somewhere. And so it's really, really hard to come up with compelling examples to show people the benefits. Um, and that's why talks like the ones we had this afternoon about the game system architecture and Chris's stuff, all of these things are really vitally important because they illustrate how it helps. Right? Everybody talks about, oh, it has concurrency and oh, it has you know, immutable whatever and everything. Yeah, but what people really want to know is how is this going to help me in my day job? And those things are the kind of things that help people understand that. So the more of those we do, the more 
use reports, the more, you know, sort of blog posts, videos, everything you do, but on, not on just like, you know, this is how patent matching works, but this is how Erlang saved my butt, this is how Elixir made my life happy, right? Those are the kind of things that we need to see. Hey, Chris. Two mics, eh? Yeah. Uh, so just to, uh, I think Eric said it. I think very much it's a very much a if you build it, they will come atmosphere right now. I think that we have awesome technology and awesome standard library. It's just a matter of building compelling libraries, and that's what I'm trying to do with Phoenix. And I think um, another issue is some people are so caught outside of the ecosystem that they don't understand what it can actually do. Uh, I think what I try to show is like Node Connect and showing how easy distributed programming is. Uh, usually um, like blows people's minds. And I think for me coming outside into Elixir, when I first saw that, it clicked in my head the possibilities, but I think people on the outside don't actually really think the fundamental shift that the ecosystem allows. So if we could address that without saying it's distributor fault tolerant, that really doesn't drive home um, being able to set up your laptop, someone across from you being able to do Node Connect and be running code distributively just with no fanfare. So I think if we could address that, to really drive home the benefits somehow with some specific vocabulary or video or blog post, that would be really, really beneficial. Um, so there's, there have been some um, comments and, or um, blog posts about tension between the Erlang and Elixir communities. Could you give your take on that? Um, okay, there have been, well, if you look at it the way I see it, if you look at the Erlang community, there is a small portion of the Erlang community which are pretty negative to Elixir. And some of those are pretty, pretty loud. And they're usually loud about everything, right? So they're not loud specifically about Elixir. They'll, if they don't like something, they'll be very loud about it. Uh, there's, a, there's a small portion here which are quite favorable. I'm guessing quite a few of them are here. And there's a large block in the middle which are neither, really. Um, they're not. Some might know about it. Some just aren't interested in changing. They're working with, they're happy with what they've got. They're not interested in it. Do you agree, Francesco? Absolutely. Just to add to, to what Robert said, you know, those who are negative, not necessarily negative, they're critical, and they're just as critical towards internal airline libraries and towards other activities internal people within the airline community are doing. And I think you know, that's sometimes the price you pay when you start growing to a certain amount, you start attracting um, characters uh, and you know looking you know at some of the blog posts I've read from the Lixir side I think a lot of it was based on misunderstandings um, you know I think there was a lot of uh, writings about videos from the airline factory not being released immediately and that they were forgotten or filmed on iPhones and other surreal stuff and well I mean none of that is correct there, there were two tracks which the producers were able to actually process whilst they were filming and release the same day, pretty much. And there were two tracks which, uh, you know, took about, which we had to process ourselves, which, you know, took about two weeks um, to do after the conference and after you've recovered. And, you know, same camera teams and you know, we didn't even tell the camera teams which rooms to pick. Uh, you've got so many things when you're running a conference on your mind, you know, telling them to go in and pick one track or the other uh, is the last thing on your mind at these points. And yeah, I mean, the, that, that's, that, so there's no, uh, there's no conspiracy theories behind that. It's just you know, trying to get as much done as possible you know, within possible time frames. Yeah. Of course, we're, we're out for them, right? So I would suggest I'm, war, I'm warning um, Chassé and Eric to be very careful when you're out. We've got these exit teams out ready to send you a shutdown signal, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, of course not. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Let's take the first question from the audience. So um, I think that um, you know, Elixir is a larger thing than just something that would lend itself to one killer application or uh, one specific purpose. But I think that sort of thing can really help to drive awareness of and adoption of something. Um, like DHH's famous 10 minute blog uh, video that he did for Rails, I think that really helped propel it forward in a lot of people's minds. And in my mind, one of the big things that Elixir could make um, more accessible would be concurrency. But I have a hard time thinking of a good example that you could do, you know, a short, problem or demonstration of it to show concurrency solving or a concurrent processing 
in a short period of time. Like when I uh, did concurrent processing in one of my uh, classes, we did the like model of a fake video store. And I'm not sure if like having a 10 minute video of a fake video store or of growing food in fields, you know, and having it harvested would have quite the same impact because it's not quite as imminently practical as the 10 minute blog post. Can you think of an example of concurrent processing that might be a good demonstration of that? You should look at that in the movie, part two. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, well, in less than 10 minutes to demo a chat server, which you know, scales to tens of thousands of users. So Maybe instead of video store, something like Netflix. <laughs> yeah. <or> <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, I can just one comment to that. I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the one of the every time someone makes does something serious, a product which is actually being used, and the company's happy with and makes money, it's it's a benefit. In this say, in this case, I'm saying both for Elixir and Alang, in that one sense, it doesn't make any difference. We're sort of in the same ecosystem. So if you do make something and it's successful and it works and it helps you, tell the world about it. Literally, I think. All too many times, you, you saw um, the list of icons I had on, on my last, last slide. Most of those companies don't say anything. Now, they're not being secretive, they're just not saying anything. They, they just don't think it's interesting, which means we lose these, these free ads, right? So, yeah, so if you do something, when you do something that's successful, tell the world about it. I think that's a big help. And Dave, did you have something to add? And the next question from the audience. Um, so right now, Phoenix doesn't have a model layer because you want to be flexible. But as far as I know, there's not a good, um, even a GitHub project to do validation. And so validation is, it doesn't really work with pattern matching because the whole point of validation is to gather all your errors and present them nicely to the end user. So there's not a good way to do validation. I think there was one library that was, when there are similar records and he abused the, the author abused the meth the fake methods that records allowed to do validation, and so I don't know if there's a good um, migration path for having uh, active model style validations from Rails. Yeah, I think uh, Jose or Eric may be able to answer. I know Ecto has validations now, right? And I know that there's some, I forget the name of the library now, some kind of valid EX. Uh, there is a standalone library that just handles data validation without any kind of model uh, layer that you can just include into your, your model and and it has uh, some nice rules set up for you. Uh, so there's definitely a couple options today. Is there any way? I'll echo what Chris said, um, and also what Dave said, in that um, you know, there, are some, there are some models that are springing up that do validation much like Active Record did, but I would love to see an approach that didn't mirror the Rails approach to validation. Yeah, that's, yeah so that's what Acto does, we focused, we actually, I think, borrowed from, was it from a closure library? I think so, yeah. That focused more on composition. You should not be forced to write a macro with a pretty name just because you want to validate something, right? Uh, yeah, so there is something in Acto, and we plan to have to put more resources into Acto after Elixir 1.0 is out, so yeah. Is there any integration with the I-18 stuff? So like, the, the way Rails validation works is all the error messages are actually from the I-18N. Right, there isn't any right now. It's just a matter of time. We'll get there, yeah. Okay, and um, uh, does the I-18N integration in Phoenix now read the YAML files from Rails? Um, so right, yes, one question per person. Oh, sorry. Um, Hi there. Um, apologies if this is a bit of a beginner question, but I just started learning Elixir two days ago. Um, I'm having a good time with it so far. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Um, on the website, a lot is made of Elixir's metaprogramming capabilities, and as a Rubyist, that's a big draw for me. What I haven't been able to tell, since I'm trying to learn Erlang simultaneously, and I haven't quite gotten that far in my studies yet, um, are Elixir's metaprogramming capabilities the same as Erlang's macros, or does Elixir also add metaprogramming capabilities that, that Erlang itself does not have? Okay, so no, they are very, they are very different. So you're coming from uh, Ruby? M Ruby and a number of other procedural okay. languages before. This is my first functional language. Okay, awesome. So yeah, so Erlang ones is closer to templates, right? In the sense, um, 
C macros. See, I can say like cash to find and C. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're C macros. They're literally modeled on C macros. Yeah, it's basically you, you define a macro and you kind of go get the variables and you just inject in there. Uh, in Elixir, is actually different because, so it's closer to Lisp macros because you can, you're actually passing code representation from one place to the other. And that's different uh, from Ruby too because in Ruby, all you do evolving, you do string evaluation, you do uh, class evolve to define functions in a class, or you do something like define a method where you rely on the binding. Yeah, so they have three different approaches uh, in between, uh, between them, and Elixir is closer to this because it's about, so in my talk, I talk about the code representation, right? So it's interesting because it's not only about code generating code or code replacing code, but it's ultimately about code transforming code. And that's why we can have uh, uh, unless implemented in terms of, of if, because unless you just transform it into a negated if. So that's the general idea. Thank you. I can just make one quick. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, no. Well, Erlang has one more, and that's a parse transform. Oh yeah, parse transform. Yeah, sure. Say mentioned it, but that's sort of the ultimate because you get the whole module in one go, and you can do whatever you want with it and return it with a completely whole module. So it, it's, it's, it, you can do anything, but it gives you full power to really kill yourself, right? <laughs> so, so from that point of view, Elixir macros are extremely safe. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with, with Elixir, it's pretty easy to work with uh, Erlang code. Uh, uh, you know, just bringing it in and, with, uh, and running depths and so on. Uh, are there any barriers right now for um, Erlang projects to use Elixir code? And if there are barriers, is there work being done to make it a, you know, just a complete homogeneous system? Um, good question. So today, I think the barriers for someone to use more of Elixir in, in Erlang is that uh, you need to teach Erlang to compile Elixir code. And uh, so you most likely, the best way for you to do that is to use mix. So it, it's kind of a tough one because you kind of need to change your build tools. But there are some rebar plugins. They don't work as well as mix because mix is really smart. It compiles everything in parallel. It's also able to figure out what changes in between compilations to avoid compiling uh, many things. It dumps the graph of your project and can find what changed it. And, in the graph, uh, and the rebar wouldn't have all the things. So that's one. I had, yeah, I had something else, but I forgot. Um, and there are plans to to make it better. Um, Eric. Sure. So we have plans for bringing hex to uh, right for bringing hex and. Um, and one way to do that is to bundle both hex and mix together so that you don't, so you get mix without inst installing, uh, right. Um, you get mix without installing Elixir. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then expose, and then expose uh, not only hex, but some of the mix tasks as well. So kind of have a subset of mix running for uh, for Erlang developers. Yeah, but you still need to figure out how you're going to configure Mix because today is very based on, on, on Elixir terms and so on. But we are having those discussions back and forth, so. We have a follow-up real quick. I, I just wanted to add to this. I mean, what I'd love to see, the, see is um, much more interaction between the two communities developing frameworks. Um, we're in desperate need of a distributed framework which allows you to go in and start you know, providing different architectural and distributed patterns. And, you know, and you know, Elixir will need it just as much as, you know, as, the, as the Erlang world. And I think you know, this is you know, imperative that you know, this kind of interoperability between languages is sorted out in a, in a standard way. 
So, and my, my question was a little bit of a leading question because we've been talking about uh, adoption rate and so on. And if they're, you know, between the Erlang community and the Elixir community, you know, if it was all very easy on either side to mix and match and so on, I think all over we'd get, uh, we'd get a better adoption rate, so. And, and uh, my view there is, you know, the right way is in OTP you've got the applications which you use to bundle software. And that should be the most basic package with you know, well-defined APIs, which, which could be used then from respective languages. I think that's the right component, the right level in where you start you know, bundling. And just to follow up on that, I think that's a really important uh, education issue on the Elixir side, because it's very counterintuitive to think about creating these applications. I mean, basically, when you see the word application in Elixir, think library. Yeah, and if you think of it that way, then go forth and start creating these little applications. They're not necessarily things that do something on their own. They're just libraries, yeah? And that's how you can contribute back. Should we say library or components? Because oh, Robert, yeah. components. Components. Yeah, components are a better word. You're absolutely right. Okay. Yeah. A bin binary component? I mean, you compile it down to Beam code, uh, doesn't it cross Verlang? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no problem with that. So that, that's why getting back to, well, the applications and components, they're a collection, usually a collection of Beam files at that level. That's what I thought. Yeah. You were saying earlier about getting text and mix to understand. Well, that's another, that's another problem. That's at a higher level problem, how you okay. put package all these things together. But it, at, at the module level, or the beam level, that they're completely compatible. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, in theory, after you compile, you are golden. You don't need to worry about interoperation, uh, inter yeah, at all. But you need to get to the point until you compile, right? Okay, so this is kind of inspired by the first question that was asked from the audience, and then also something Chris said in his talk. Uh, kind of combining the idea of like what would be a killer, the killer app, the killer feature use case, um, as opposed to concurrency or something that could demonstrate that Chris brought up the, the Internet of Things. And I think about killer applications, and one of the things that made Rails this big wow moment for a lot of people, particularly me, was that you don't have to worry. Active Record did the database stuff for you for whatever database you're using Postgres, SQLite, MySQL, whatever. What would it take? To, or is it worthwhile? Or is there something we could do to be like to have the Active Record for the Internet of Things? Like, I can't afford a smart refrigerator, so I don't have one yet, so I don't know what that would take, but what would that mean? Is that a potential use case? Would that demonstrate something worthwhile to people? Well, actually, it's funny, because when he was doing his uh, talk, I was thinking um, I got myself a Spark Core uh, last week, or the week before, and I'm having a blast playing with it, and when I get home, I'm going to try and uh, tie it up to one of your channels and you know, have this thing talking in there. Um, the idea of a, a demo that you had like you know, half a dozen spot calls talking both amongst themselves would also up to servers and you know, somehow communicating or whatever else um, would be really, really cool. I don't think, my understanding is that we're not yet at the point where, um, I mean, everything talks differently and there's, there's, no, there's no current like um, set of protocols that you could try and map into one thing. But I think we certainly could um, start looking at uh, for example, the Sprout people already have a server that when they're, when one of your little Sprout calls, Sprout calls like a, a system on a chip plus a Wi-Fi chip, and it's about the size of my thumb, but only about an eighth of an inch thick, right? You plug it in, it goes online and connects up to their server. You can then talk to it just over the web via a REST interface via their server down to your Sprout call. Really cool. But we do the same thing into our own servers using Phoenix, for example, um, do PubSub, do event looking, you know, sort of monitor for events, you know, has someone just opened my front door, whatever else. Um, it would be a real simple demo to put together, but I think it would be pretty compelling. There is going to be a, I believe there's like a hackathon happening in Las Vegas, like AT&T is paying a bunch of money for. I just happen to know someone involved. And it's going to be all around automated home stuff. So if there's some way to get something together, I think it's in September. Um, I'll send an email or something because I'm really curious what we might be able to provide to those guys. You're going to be playing around with that anyway. You know, I, it terrifies me to think of, um, you know, the death copter and the maid and Dave programming his own car. I don't know if I'm going to sleep for weeks after this conference. 
Yeah, so just to, to expand a little bit on the last question. I was talking to Chris actually after I saw Martin's talk uh, that it could be interesting to, it could be interesting to, because in Martin's talk he was doing explicitly a call to protocol uh, JSON, right? So all the serialization details, they were there and maybe we could treat the, the, the client, the browser. I think Joe actually has a project that does that as an Erlang process. So I can just send messages to it transparently and then serialization is taken care of. It's something I don't need to worry. So in the same way, when I have two Erlang nodes talking, uh, I don't need to worry about how those things are serialized and so on. Um, we could actually do the same for for clients and not sure if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's one of the ways to, to explore this kind of um, everything connected. So one of the one of the best and worst things about like Ruby and Node ecosystems and these things is that you can find packages to do anything. And one of the things I'm curious about is that like we, we're still a fairly small community and is there a punch list somewhere of like libraries of frameworks of things that we really need. So like for example, earlier we had service discovery and then we chimed in with our from own bit lab saying, yeah, hey, I've got discovery, check this out. Or um, the work being done on Phoenix, for example, like is there a list of things that we don't have yet that we would like to have, or like the priority on getting, like better GUI toolkits or better numerical stuff or you know, internet of things stuff? Is, is there a place that we can find that? So the list of things that are missing, uh, that's mostly, that's basically the question. Or not like issue tracking stuff. Are you going to issue tracking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool bugs, but I mean, just more overall. Here's what we want to take over the world. Like here's okay. <laughs> so I'll ask you in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Try it out, and then yeah, those things will be missing. It's and yeah, and then you have your list, and then we can start working on that. I think maybe yeah, maybe some of us have some suggestions or some ideas. So Francesco just said something that can do distributed processing, um, be able, I guess, to, in, so Chris also referenced that that's basically, oh, I have, I need to crawl pages, right? How can I do that using eight nodes available to me? Something like that. So that's one. Um, well, I was just going to say that I, my, I, I think we don't have a command economy in libraries here. Sorry, components. Um, uh, I think instead, and it's the same with Ruby, uh, the best things came along because someone needed to solve a problem. Um, and I think the same thing is true here. If you don't do that, then you're going to end up with a whole bunch of wishy-washy, you know, not particularly exciting libraries. Um, I, w I think the most important thing is um, discovery. And if we can settle on Hex, for example, as being the place that things go, possibly maybe add the ability to add, uh, well, I guess you can do that already, kind of like nascent empty projects to Hex, just to like, you know, put a placeholder to say, hey, I'm working on whatever it might be, and that might be an interesting start. Um, but I think, I, you know, I think that's, you know, you, you've got to let the, the community work it out for itself. Yeah, so yeah, that's uh, what I said today morning, right? I have my own ideas, but what matters is like your ideas, right? Because, um, and, and one thing that Elixir has that Ruby never had is I have forgotten or lost count of the number of conversations I've had with Matt about, hey, could we try this as a syntax extension or that or the other, you know? Dozens of things I was asking about. And the way Ruby is built, that's really hard to do, and he was very reluctant to make those changes. But here, everybody gets the whole language as a playground, and you can pretty much hack what you want to. So it's not just libraries you can write, it's new syntax. Um, and you know, that's the kind of thing, again, where you put it out there, if people like it and it gets to be popular, who knows? You know? a, a very minor follow-on to this, uh, along the same topic then, is just, again, best practices. Should we be trying to come up with, come up with things from scratch or should we be looking towards the airline community and either wrap it or just call it across from airline? Like, what is, what is our protocol there? So our official recommendation is don't wrap unless there is a really good reason to. So there was a talk about uh, ETS, for example, right? That you need to use the early module. Um, 
So yeah, you're, and that's the plan. They're probably going to continue using the Erlang model for a while because there is absolutely no reason to, to wrap. Um, and then yeah, if there are existing solutions, just uh, go and use that. So, be, so for example, I talked about Conquehor, which is a fantastic tool that is in Erlang. There is absolutely no reason to, to re-implement it or something like that. Um, yeah, and, and usually they are very open for, for extensions. Uh, so, yeah, so for example, I had some suggestions for a particular tool and I'm, and I'm very confident that they would be open to th those kind of improvements, right? So, yeah, so if it's in Erlang, we should try to reuse it as much as possible. And, and then if it's outside, right, uh, from other communities, then if it's a good idea, let's definitely try and see where that goes. I'm sorry to keep jumping in here, but actually more things keep occurring to me. The other thing I'd say is when it comes to implementing stuff for the community, let's not just implement stuff that like, hey, we need JSON encoding, we need this, we need that, right? I think, coming back to what I was saying on the first day, um, we have here the ability to start totally greenfield. Right. We can do anything we want. Um, it doesn't have to be practical out of the gate. Right. So if you've got some fantasy about linking all the world's thermostats together into some global whatever, go for it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be practical. It doesn't have to be wrapping an Erlang library or you know, creating something that you know, is going to be popular out there in the community. I would much rather see a whole bunch of really, really exotic you know, failures that had one raging success in the middle of them than a whole bunch of boring JSON libraries. <laughs> uh, so my team and I have been working in Elixir for about seven months now, and we found um, types, specs, and dialyzer um, super helpful. Um, it doesn't seem like there's an emphasis on that within the community, and I wanted yep. to get the opinion of the core team about what they think the future and yeah, perfect assessment. Yeah, so uh, Dialyzer is uh, super useful. A lot of people find it extremely useful. But we, we've always worried about accessibility in the sense the tools need to be easy to use. I should not feel lost. And the current, and, and there are some projects, so there is one a really good one that allows you to run uh, an external project that allows you to run dialyzer tasks with mix. And um, yeah, so, and it's probably going to continue as a project for a while because we need to do work on dialyzer because most of the times I, got a dial I get a dialyzer error and I have no idea what I should do after that, right? It requires a lot of, um, it requires, it requires Training, maybe is not the best uh, word, but you get the idea, right? So, and the terms there are, are printed in Erlang, which uh, doesn't help. So, if you want to make it, for, so if you want to make it first class, we need to uh, have Elixir forma uh, formati formatting for the terms. Uh, come up with uh, how to make the message better and clear and clearer. And sometimes it's an issue intrinsic to type systems. Sometimes we cannot make it. But we can probably have bigger reports, right? Like, oh, you got, this, uh, you got this error. And then it can show some examples or in which occasions those error happens and how you can fix it. So there is a bunch of work to be done there for me to, for us to consider like, this is super accessible. I'm not going to feel lost. I can navigate through those waters nicely. Uh, yeah, you said if, it, if it's to be considered first class, just whether you believe that it is, that it should be first class citizen within Elixir? Yes, exactly. To, so we can ship with dialyzed tasks out of the box. To me, those would be requirements. Just a side note on dialyzer. One of my favorite taglines for my team is, oh god, the bees are in my eyes from all the errors and stuff. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, my question becomes, I'm still pretty fairly big Erlang noob. I've been programming in Erlang for like seven months now, but we make really heavy use of common test. And I was wondering if there's any plans to bring that into Elixir or expand upon XUnit or anything like that. Um, there isn't. Uh, there aren't any plans for uh, bringing common test. 
it would be nice to have discussions on what we are missing from common test or how we, or maybe I've heard other people saying that they would like to use common test with Elixir. So we could try to figure out how to make it, it possible as an external library. But it would also be really nice to hear what we are missing from common test, uh, test to make X unit go there. Because one of the reasons that uh, we decided early on to go with our own test framework. Uh, so macros was a part of it and having a nice formatting when you get an error and so on. But it was also because of the development cycle. Because if you are depending on, on uh, a tool from OTP, like a test framework that is really essential and there is like fast iteration cycles at the beginning, uh, it would slow us down, right? Because if there is a bug or if there is a limitation that we need to add, we need to wait for a six months release cycle and so on. So even for the OTP team, is fantastic and they're really open to the exchange, to, to, to additions and improvements and uh, extensions. It's, it's a slower cycle that we can, could, cannot afford at this point. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say the difference I see it is that, I mean, common test is for test, really designed for testing systems. S setting up a whole, setting up a system and running tests on a running, on a running system, rather than, say, testing one module or something like this. And I think uh, you should be, you should be able to run um, uh, common test with Elixir, although the, the output will probably look like Erlang, right? Uh, but you can, put, you can, I think you can fit around with that if you really want to. It's quite, it's quite programmable. It might look a little bit funny, but it should work. It's, um, there are some macros, but they are extremely trivial. Literally very trivial. Um, so it, it, it should actually work. I don't know if you've actually tested it, but uh, I think it should work. It works, yeah. Oh, okay. Is it open source? No. <laughs> And have you done anything special, a special interface, or just running it straight off? Yeah, it was just the module names would look funny, but that's about it, right? I think. Awesome. All right, uh, super important question. Uh, in the Ruby community, uh, Gorby Puff's kind of the unofficial mascot. I'm wondering if we could make Moose the unofficial mascot <laughs> of, of Elixir. <laughs> You'd have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> he seems rather indifferent right now. Well played, sir. <laughs> so this is a question from the internet. Um, True Droid, uh, Lexi Sholuk, who really wanted to be here. Um, Very nice for going to the internet for a question. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> he wants to know uh, what the panelists think of validating options, like passing a keyword list or property list. Is it a good is it good style to raise on bad options? I think I say yes because I actually got bitten just yesterday by calling a standard library and I misspelled one of the, the options and it took me forever to discover what I'd done wrong. Um, so I think there are definitely times to do that. And I think it also goes along with the idea is, okay, so right now we're passing in keyword lists, right? But imagine instead we're passing in maps. Well, then I would get the checking. So, but, you know, that's an implementation issue, right? Why, you know, it's, they're both dicts, so maybe I should have the checking with the, on the other side. It's still a subset thing. If we mistype a key, we still aren't going to find it. You match on a subset of the map so oh, that's true. the only way to do it would be to say this thing should only have those keys and not anything else. So fetch bank, just say the key is there, but if, yeah, so fetch bank, it's, yeah, but not all options may be required. The issue is that there is an option which is optional and uh, yeah, you just mistype it and, and it doesn't work. It's. Maybe there's just room for one extra function in dict, which would be make sure there's nothing in here apart from the following. Yeah. You know, that yeah. Take call or something like that. Yeah. There was, uh, oh, designed by internet, that has to be the first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's just a question down here.
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so assert valid keys would check just those keys exist and nothing nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so the first thing I, that I thought when I came to Elixir was syntax was nice, and the second thing I thought was uh, what's a cool thing that I could do with this? Um, I know, Dave, you mentioned there's, there's no real like easy problem that like utilizes extreme concurrency um, and massive scalability, but I was wondering, uh, I mean, Phoenix looks like a great opportunity to do something cool right off the bat. Um, do you guys have like a personal thing that you've done that's kind of uh, noteworthy and worthy of bragging about? Okay. I've heard you help build telephone switches or something like that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, but was, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. We're all just modest. <laughs> they got nothing. He stumps the panel. Maybe you should go read a book. So, so one second. Can we ex we extend the previous question to the audience? First thing I wrote was a chat server. A chat server. So chat server. Who's got something better than chat server? <laughs> no, don't be judgmental. No, that's not helpful, no, Bruce. This is an arms race. We've got to, got to raise the bar. Chat server's great. This get better. Yes. Uh, it's kind of trivial, but here's a Phoenix project that I'm working on actually, like right now. You like this talking. Uh, it's called um, the Elixir Cauldron, and it's going to be a community-driven tutorial site, so that people with tutorials they can submit them, and they can say how long it takes to go through them, and then you can search for tutorials based on how much time you have to complete it. Community-driven tutorial site actually written at Elixir Conference. That's pretty cool. Um, other ideas from the audience? Yes, back here. Well, the first thing I wrote was what I presented yesterday. OK, that's awesome. Telephone system, yes. I wrote a Fibonacci sequence generator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you copied that from Dave. Fibonacci sequence, yes. And, uh, hey, Bruce, I was going to. I was going to take one. Um, wasn't a, anything crazy. It was just a simple OTP app. But what I run for uh, my Elixir workshops is a, I call it a distributed tweet aggregator, where uh, I have all the attendees connect up on a cluster. And uh, my projector node globally registers itself as the aggregator. And all the clients spin up a Twitter client, ask my uh, aggregator node for my Twitter, personal Twitter uh, auth key and token. And then uh, they fetch. Twitter search results and send it to the projector, and the projector displays the results. Uh, so it's a really, not an insane app, but it's a really easy way to show the benefits to newcomers about how we can run on a cluster. Uh, so that's been a fun thing that I've been able to do. Anybody else got one from the audience? All right. So uh, my question is now uh, that I actually have two people who actually implement languages. Like, uh, I'm going to draw uh, from the backstory, like, CoffeeScript and JavaScript. Like, uh, all the CoffeeScript had, like, a lot of great ideas to improve the syntax of JavaScript that, at the end, that they got implemented. Uh, is there something like that for Erlang? Like, uh, version 18, 19 will have uh, some syntactic trigger that Elixir has? I, I don't find. I very much doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So one thing, and it was actually really nice to see it, uh, that uh, it's going to come with Erlang, um, the next Erlang version, the 18th, um, is that. So today, when you're defining supervision trees in Erlang, it's a bunch of tuples, mm. and you need to define everything. And now we, on Erlang, uh, the next Erlang version, they're planning for you to pass maps. And you don't actually, so the maps already help because when you have a tuple, you don't have the name of the fields. So you have like one and five, but you have no idea what, uh, what they actually mean. So having limit fields uh, help. And they're also going to have the full values for some of those things. And yeah, and that's something that we are, we are doing already for a while. Uh, which was cool to see, and the discussion on the mailing list when they were proposing this feature is exactly to make it more accessible. So, yeah, that, that was cool. Okay. 
got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, so I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're going to get serious adoption until we get like you know reactive programming in Elixir. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Robert wants to take that on. Too. <laughs> uh, I, I won't say anything. I think it's best. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there was this reactive programming manifesto. Okay, so now everyone will know. And um, in principle, I thought the text was okay. What annoyed me was, what really annoyed me was it was presenting reactive programming something new, something new and innovative. And okay, from the album point of view, we've been doing it for over 20 years and we definitely weren't the first. If anyone's ever written anything for a processor using interrupts, you're doing reactive programming, right? And that's from the 70s, so that really annoyed me. <laughs> that's the reason why I didn't ever sign it. <laughs> so, no, so Jim knows that. <laughs> no, no, real question. So I was just... Uh, wait, wait, wait. I, oh. I actually want to, to, to discuss on that because um, there is that, right? And there is... Um, and there is functional reactive programming, which is slightly there, but, but not really. And, and this conversation is happening because reactive is now a buzzword, right? Yeah. So uh, what should we do? Because there is one option, which is, Ignore. you know, yeah, but there is one option to say, you know, this is okay. It's good to know that everyone is thinking about reactive now, and look, here's how you actually do reactive properly, right? And it goes to your talk and to Francesco talks, like you need to have a dedicated uh, channel for uh, error handling. Error handling is a very uh, important part of writing reactive code. And then we can at least go on the waves. I tend to get allergies when, you know, uh, when you know, people try to be buzzword compliance. Uh, it's you know, the way it used to be with Corba and you know, everything else you know, back in the mid-90s. But uh, I think, well, if they ask, just say yes, Elixir is reactive and it has always been and always will be, you know. <laughs> yeah, great answer. So, um, yeah, I just want to end. Yes, I'm all for reactive programming, right? Reactive systems, that, that's it. Um, if you really look at it, literally every system is reactive. It's just that whether you want to call it that or how, how it looks, but in, in principle, everything's reactive, right? But just to take a little step further, I think we could actually lead um, in a kind of less dramatic way than going the whole you know, Francesco route in terms of uh, right now, we don't really do clever things with streams. And I think we could start looking at using streams as a serialization method for otherwise temporal events and creating reactive code that way. And that would be an interesting, you know, we have, we have the ability to play with that, to experiment with that. We just don't, we're not currently, you know, really pursuing that, that actively. I mean, you can, Dave, what you'll discover um, is that it's, you know, you, you'll throw, together, throw something together in 10, 15 lines of code you know, versus other technologies where you really need applications and frameworks to deal with it. Sure. So that's why, you know, you know we've been dealing with streams in the airline world for oh, yeah, decades, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but we just, we, we, that never occurred, to, or agents, and you know, you, you'll throw together an agent with 20, 30 lines of code. And so, you know, we've never gone out and said, hey, we've got agents. Um, it, it's just, But it, there's actually, the there's a big difference, I think, between having the ability to do something and having the, intent to do it. So giving something a name um, is more than just marketing. It actually helps you think about it and helps you uh, partition your system when you're designing it. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, we said, OK, um, we had a kind of stream which is a, quote, reactive stream. And that allowed us to do things like zip between different event streams and all this kind of stuff. And then say we could make it distributed the same way that Jose was saying between browsers and, or sorry, between clients and servers and then say it was supported by Phoenix, right? Now start thinking about the cool stuff you could do, all right? I mean, I know you can do it right now, yeah? But you could do it in Assembler as well. All right, what I'm saying is we need, sorry, I was just anticipating Robert here, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, of course you can do it now. Of course you can do it now. In the same way that you could have written a web framework in Ruby now. I mean, you didn't need Rails. You know, you're all just slackers. <laughs> and it's, it's the same thing here, right? You don't, you know, all you need is a set of conventions. And that's what I suppose we could do. Well, there's, there's two things, right? One is the technology, and one is the marketing associated with the technology. And the marketing associated with the technology has value. When we can attach words and techniques, um, they're idioms. And the idioms are the things that we, we need to, to process and build bigger ideas. They're, they're like macros for the brain. And I think from that perspective, I totally agree with Robert. That, um, that Erlang um, has been reactive before reactive was reactive and that the manifesto is you know, a little, little bit of smoke um, in some ways. Um, in other ways, um, building that idiom would be tremendously val valuable for both ecosystems right now. So I'm not sure what this says, but you know, that whole question is meant to be a joke. <laughs> we just had a 10 minute serious conversation so it's the way you tell them <laughs> so the real the real question or, or um, and maybe you guys have already thought about this but go back to um, uh, Erlang and Elixir and the module or package manager or whatever you want to call it um, and I'm just kind of thinking here about you know, if we build, if we, if we take Hex, and Hex actually works for, to build Erlang, right, Erlang only. So if I have an Erlang dev, fine, I have, you know, I understand I may have to install a, an extra application that I never use to, to manage my package and build my libraries and stuff, you know, i.e., in this case, Elixir. Um, but, you know, if it's nice and easy for Erlang people and they can build completely, you know, kick butt, you know, Erlang packages or applications, and it works the same for Elixir people, it, it might be a good bridging tool. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. in, in, now, if you did that, though, you know, I, I heard you guys talking, you may want to include, include this inside Elixir, right? So really all I need is Elixir, and I've got my package manager in there, but it, it works just for Erlang. I don't have to use, I don't have to generate Elixir code. Yeah. So, so idea or? yeah. So that's uh, what is uh, on the on the roadmap uh, for for Hex. How we can integrate uh, better with the Erlang ecosystem. Not only Erlang. Uh, I was uh, talking to to Duncan uh, about LFE two and how we can integrate that with uh, other languages. So yeah, there's a little bit of back and forth still until we figure out. I uh, should say a little bit of tinkering to we figure out what is the best way to do that, to avoid code duplication and everything that comes with it. We also don't want to, so usability should go both ways because today is a very, usability is really good from the Elixir side, but you know, we don't have bad usability from the Erlang side, right? It should have good usability too on everything. On the API you use to configure it, on the Erlang messages, so yeah, so, we're working on it, and so, we'll so see. W have you guys thought about, like, with, with a system like compile NIFs automatically for various architectures, kind of like Ruby Gems does, or is this totally beyond the scope of what we're currently Yeah, doing? So, so today it's just like you compile Bing, and that's it. You, we don't need to worry about anything uh, platform dependent, really. Um, for, for NIFs, right? So yes, uh, yes. Yeah. But there are myths, and we actually had a plan. So one of the Google Summer of Code students for this year, his plan was to improve the Windows support and eventually to get to the point where we have NIFs and have uh, compilation in between, in different, uh, between different platforms. Uh, platforms. But we, we never got to it because we started working on the Windows installer, which is more important to have a good workflow. and. Uh, installation on Windows. Uh, Francesco has been doing a similar work from the Erlang side, right? Have a good Erlang installers as well for Windows and Mac, Ubuntu, Debian, and so on. Yeah, so we, yeah, it was postponed. Okay. Uh, so let's, that about wraps it up. Um, we're out of time. And does the panel have any, want to make a, you guys want to make a closing comment, each of you guys? 
Uh, definitely. Thank you for organizing ElixirConf. Uh, thanks. It has been fantastic. Uh, thank ev thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's really amazing to see everyone here. I know that everyone here is responsible for the language growth in, one, uh, in many different ways, right? Uh, or is it the language, or it's the documentation, or it's the community where we live? So yeah, it has been two excellent days. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. For all of you people who are tired of syntax uh, and love parentheses, there is LFE, right? <laughs> 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 We can translate it to anything, right? <laughs> and that concludes the conference. <laughs>